I, I experienced that, you know, growing up, I, I played in the woods, but I didn't have any like intimate knowledge of it. And as I became an adult, I, I knew nothing and, and none of my priorities or my values were, had any kind of nature focus, right? Other than that, I would go disc golfing and I needed to watch out for like poison ivy. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, as I've gone through that process, it, you know, it feels very much like learning a language or, or learning to read. You know, at first you can you, you hear things and you're just curious, right? You're like, I don't, are they talking about me? Like, what are, they, what are they saying? And then, yeah, as you go through that process, you start to delineate, you know, sounds and behaviors. Um, and then it becomes more engaging because like you're in on the conversation, right? It's like my, my little brother who's fluent in German. Like he just, even just hearing people speak German by him, he like gets excited because he's like in a little club right and and that's the same way as we start to tune and tap into nature we we feel this sense of belonging and i think at the core of what nature connection can do for people is give you the sense of belonging right that you you know similar to that agape principle like you just you belong here because like you are a human and you have the capacity to take part in these conversations passively or actively um wherever you are whether you know as long as you have access to a window um you're able to to start participating um in this conversation welcome to the evolve move play podcast where we bring you the most interesting and enlightening conversations around movement practice and how you can become the most heroic version of yourself through pursuing movement that's relevant to your nature this is a podcast that's going to feature some of the top movers in the world some of the most amazing movement thinkers and people from fields that are related to movement as far afield as evolutionary theory strength and conditioning and everything in between so if you're interested in movement please stick around. And if you like our work and want to support it, please consider supporting us on Patreon because this podcast is completely listener supported. We don't want to take any advertising. We don't want to interrupt your experience of watching the show. So what really helps us get the best thinkers on, have the time to put these together, have the best quality for you guys as far as audio and video is your support. So please consider supporting us and enjoy the rest of the show. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Evolve Move Play podcast. Today our guest is Kyle Koch. Kyle Koch is a wilderness awareness teacher and movement teacher who is one of our teachers here at Evolve Move Play. And we wanted to share his perspective and talk particularly about, about nature connection practices and how important they are. Um, before we get into the interview, I did want to mention that we have just released our online membership system. So we built an online course and we tested that out and then we wanted to expand it so that we could have a membership for you guys to support you and we can continue to share with you consistently month to month. A lot of people are gonna not have access to the gym right now. This is a great time to get involved. If you, you know, we've discounted everything to make it easy for you because we know how hard things are with what's going on. Um, so great time to get involved with Evolve Move Play. Obviously it helps us also survive what's going on. So we'll have a link below where you can go check out what the membership looks like and all the benefits you get. Um, that's what's going on. This conversation with Kyle, uh, it's a really interesting conversation. We wanted to talk about nature connection, particularly because a lot of people are going to be denied a lot of their normal activities and a little bit of mindfulness, a little bit of nature connection can go a long way to helping us calm down and center ourselves in what we're doing today. We also get into the sustainability of natural movement practices, the relationship between nature connection, mindfulness, and natural movement, and um, many other interesting topics and Kyle's background and fun stories about freezing in the woods and, uh, or not freezing in the woods and surviving it. So without further ado, Kyle Koch. Kyle, welcome on the podcast, it's great to have you. Yeah, thanks for having me, super excited to be here today. So you've been, so tell us your story, right? You were a computer programmer until when? How old were you when you quit that? Um, I went to a tech school to get like Microsoft certified and went through that whole process around like 21. 
And then I was in the IT field working for a software company. Um, we did like all the barcodes that you see on labels, like programmed all these barcodes and what they do and all that kind of stuff for about three years. And then I moved and then eventually I realized I didn't have any skills. Like when the power would go out and the phone would go out, I didn't have any like tangible, useful skills. All my skills were dependent on electricity essentially yeah. um, and then I did a three-day survival course where I learned how to make a friction fire where you rub like two sticks together and that literally changed my life I was like wow holy shit I am so capable of so much more with the least technologically advanced things um, and then after that, I eventually attended a nine month program here in Washington. And then I put those skills to the test living in the woods and working in wilderness therapy for about one year. And then I worked for the wilderness awareness school, which is the school that I attended. Um, I worked for them for about six years. So when was all that? That was about eight years. Ago. Between, yeah, like, IT was probably like 2010, 2009, 2010. And then uh, I went to the Wilderness Awareness School in 2011. Okay. So the IT school was just in 2010, did you say? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know the dates. It was, it was a six month program. Yeah. That you get certified and then you graduate and they like place you in the field. So within that year, I both attended school, graduated and got a job um, in the field. Nice. But you, did, so you didn't stay in that field very long, though, that, before you went to the Wilderness Awareness School stuff. No, I was there like I think I was about to go into my third year. And I, yeah, I left at that point to to go to the wilderness awareness school cashed out on google ads so wilderness awareness school was uh founded by john young correct yes it was founded by john young i think in 98 here in washington and young is is one of the major figures in kind of uh wilderness practices i guess what is there wilderness awareness is there another broader term for that yeah, the kind of the most broad term is nature connection. And then John Young is specifically eight shields, cultural mentoring. Mm -hmm. And John Young was a student of Tom Brown. Yes. And Tom Brown is kind of the probably the most famous person who started advocating these kinds of skills again in the modern world. Is that correct? Yeah, he, in general, in this type of movement, so Tom Brown, when he was about eight years old, he was mentored by an Apache scout named Stalking Wolf, um, or as they call him, Grandfather, who, he was one of the last Apaches in the, I believe the late 1800s is when he left his reservation and kind of spent his life acquiring all these skills and then in the 1960s uh grandfather's grandson rick was tom's best friend so okay. tom and rick grew up with grandfather as their mentor um practicing the skills of awareness and tracking mm -hmm. so you you were you're doing all this wilderness stuff and then at some point you discovered parkour and started training at parkour visions after i had left correct yeah, so at the Wilderness Awareness School, they have like a, a natural movement or animal forms curriculum. And, you know, complex movement, as you know, through the forest is required. Yeah. And I was so enlivened um, tracking animals at the Oregon sand dunes and, and trying to be in my body and move like a coyote um, was so nourishing to me, but I was so bad at it. <laughs> you know, I, was, I didn't have any flexibility. I couldn't sit in a squat. I couldn't do a QM for more than like a couple feet. Um, so, at, so I'd heard about Hardcore Visions and I'd been there a couple times because one of my mentors, Marcus Rainerson, they were going to Hardcore Visions. Um, but when I came back 
to work at the Wilderness Awareness School, that was when I went to Parkour Visions twice a week. Um, let's, let's back up for a second. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll come back to parkour. I want you to tell us a little bit about uh, what happened between graduating and, uh, and, and going back to work. Some crazy story about you in the wilderness in Wisconsin living. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I moved back to Wisconsin and I was a, I was a kayaking and zip lining guide. And I was just kind of teaching people all about the nature. And then I eventually got a job as a wilderness therapy guide up in the Shawamigan National Forest. And yeah, it's, if you can, I don't know how familiar people are, but northern Wisconsin is super cold. It is a deciduous forest. And I would take at-risk youth into the woods. And those kids would be there for about 11 weeks on average. And I would be there for eight days, anywhere from eight days to about 14 days. And then I, I lived uh, very close by uh, during that time. And so I was able to like implement and basically practice all these skills with kids, right? So I had a group of teenagers, um, yeah, during that time. So you're living out in, uh, in Wisconsin and this was during the winter, right? Yeah, I started in uh, mid-October and I worked through the entire winter and it was one of the coldest and longest winters in like 25 years. We literally had six feet of snow on the ground until June 1st. And I think the coldest day that I experienced was minus 57 with the wind chill. So what do you do on a minus 57 day? Like you're living in a cabin that you're heating on your own, right? Like, no, no we're... We're outside in tents. You're in tents, in minus 57. Yeah. I used to be warm. I mean, like, that can kill you pretty quickly, can it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, gear is really important, you know. Um, so, basically, we had a thing called a wall tent. It's like an armied issue tent that you set up, and it has a big uh, barrel furnace. And you basically feed that in with wood and that and that whole area in the wall tent would heat up and it'd be relatively warm in there, you know, like 30 to 40 degrees. And then outside temperatures, um, yeah, with the wind chill would be minus 57. So, you know, you got your layers on, movement, hiking, hot water bottles, lots and lots of butter, um, you know, and it was amazing how quickly you adapted. So like we never told the kids what day it was, what time it was, or what the temperature was, right? And what that really showed me is the power of your mind. Like these kids, like they fully lived out there. Like I would come back and forth, um, you know, and be there for weeks at a time. And I found it took about eight days, you know, for my body to like fully adapt. Like the first couple of days I'd be like cold. And then I'd be like, okay. And then after like the first week, I was like dialed in. Like I, I slept solid. I felt good. And you know, you have to, you have to do all the things. Like you have to wake up, and get water, and make your food. And <laughs> you know, like you put, uh, you put cheese and like peanut butter and all your food on your body and you would heat it up. And then you would take it out and make your food for the day. Because otherwise it's frozen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fun. Armpit cheese. <laughs> yeah. Better than pants cheese. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. So, so you did that. You came back and you started working for the Wilderness Awareness School. And then... You followed uh, Marcus Renderson's example. You got involved at Parkour Visions. You're training a couple days a week. Some point in there, uh, you encountered me. I don't remember how. Do you remember how we met? Yeah, I actually just ran into you at Volunteer Park one day. Okay, nice. That's, that's and that was like, you know, and I had, I had heard about you. I had seen the Tree Runner video 
Yeah. And so when I saw you, it was like a, it was like a moment of stardom. Like, <laughs> I'm like, oh, dude, like that, like that's Ray Kelly. Like, he moves epically through the trees. Like, I want to move like that. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. And then you came, uh, I think you came to Return of the Source in 2014, which was the second year. There was only seven of you guys there that year. That was, is that the first year you attended? Yeah, I'm, I'm really bad with dates. <laughs> so it, was, it, was, it was a small group the first year you came. It was our second Yeah. Year. Yeah, there was, yeah, like six or seven of us. And it was only like three or four days. And we like met on site each day. Yeah, yeah. That was, uh, we didn't. Oh, we might, Sid might have been coming down on site, but we all would have, we all stayed up on the property. Yeah. But anyways, that's, that's another here nor there. Pretty sure. Yeah. Was, but, um, okay, cool. So then, um, I think it was the next year that you came back and did wilderness practices, uh, for us, right? Like we, you actually helped us out the next year already because you've been doing it for us for several years there was one year that you didn't do it and, and one of your friends james did it but pretty much every year since you've been there with us uh sharing wilderness practices as part of the evolve move play approach yeah i think how i remember is is i was just kind of like sneaking it in like it, it became it was such a it's such a part of like who i am that i was just kind of teaching and offering um little unsolicited tidbits um in the beginning mm -hmm. uh, and then yeah and then it and then it kind of evolved between us and yeah i know like aris was there yeah but one year that i wasn't there and james and yeah it was just this interesting evolution of crossover and sharing um as it became more a part of the curriculum yeah so, you know, one particular reason why I wanted to have you on the podcast right now is because, right, uh, we want to talk about how people can have practices that help them feel a deep sense of connection and mindfulness in coronavirus, right? Like over time with Evolve Move Play, we've recognized that, that movement, um, the purpose of movement practice for us is how it changes people, right? And how it affords them a, a sense of deeper reconnection and meaning. Um, and when we move in a tree, that tree, like you have the map of the tree because it means something to you in the sense that you can move in it and that makes the tree more meaningful. But then you have the map of the tree, which is like this type of tree provides this kind of wood and this type of tree provides this type of habitat and this type of tree, you know, provides this kind of shelter, right? So like cedar trees, the, if, if people have watched the, the tree runner video, um, that you mentioned that was all shot that was shot in a group of uh western red cedars which is the third most common tree here in the northwest it's also um a tree that has an enormous amount of uses mm -hmm. so like t tell us a little bit about what the western red cedar means from a nature connection standpoint yeah so uh the western red cedar tree for me um has provided me with with so much it was the when I, my first fire kit was actually cottonwood, but when I came out here to, to Washington and I started to learn and use this tree, my very first point of connection with it was fire. That fire here in the Northwest is so important because it is so wet here. Yeah. And having a fire more than warming you or drying out your clothing is a, is a source of like morale and hope. It is like your companion in the forest. And so for me, it was making fire and, and warming myself um, and, and yeah, just learning that skill. And then eventually I've, I've gone on to, to, you know, like you said, like the cedar tree, it provides shelter just as it is. Mm -hmm. right? So if you were to walk around your neighborhood during a rain, you would find that when you would get to a dry spot and you'd look around and there'd be a circle of dryness around you and you'd look up it you know there's a high likelihood that it's a, a cedar tree that you're standing under 
right? So it was yeah. also shelter. It's a funny, funny thing about that. People often ask us how we train in the rain. And what we found is that because the cedars are show sheltered, if it's a light rain or if the rain is, is just beginning, a lot of times underneath the cedars is, is really dry and it's much easier to train under, in those cedars than it is like in an urban environment. Um, sometimes it gets really sopping wet and then, <laughs> then it's going to be wet for a while. Once the whole bark is wet and everything's wet, it, you know, it takes a little while to dry out. But I'm amazed how often I go out and it's like, today's a gray day. It looks like some rain could come down. There's a, you know, it's wet um, a little bit out there. But like, I bet if I went over to volunteer, like underneath the cedars, there'd be plenty of dry enough spaces to move around in. Yeah, and that's, you know, it's, it's pretty similar to some of the other conifer trees as they actually open up and really absorb a lot of the moisture out of the sky. It's not that they just physically protect, which is true, but they're actually absorbing that moisture. Um, so yeah, so when you're, whether you're in the city or the woods, you just, you can go and seek, you know, immediate shelter, which is, you know, rule kind of priority number one in survival. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think like every, every year when we make fire at Return of the Source, usually the, the ball of tinder, that cedar bark, isn't it? Primarily that you're using as the ball of tinder? Yeah. So yeah, so as far as fire goes, cedar provides it all right? It provides the bark for the tinder bundle. You can use a branch, a cedar wife to make a bow out of in the string. And then, uh, or the, or the roots of the cedar tree can also be used to make your bow. And then the spindle and the hearth board are all made out of cedar. So yeah, you can stop at one tree and it's a one-stop shop for all your fire needs. That's awesome. So, so let's uh, go back for a second, like to the idea of people. People need these deep reconnections. They need a reconnection to to movement, a reconnection to you know who they really are, like what motivates you, what's meaningful to you, to your body. Um, and they need reconnection to nature and to a, a tribe and a community. Um, one of uh, you know the the community aspect and the the nature aspect of things things have been things that have really grown through the course of the development of evolved move play and you've played a major role in that but in both really right like you've brought in nature connection but you've also brought a lot of the cultural pieces from how we build a culture around movement but talking about the nature connection piece for a second you know a lot of people are like, you know, people are commenting on my videos now from Italy and, and France saying, uh, I can't go out into the woods. Um, I can't climb in the trees right now. I'm not allowed to go more than 200 yards from my, my, um, my house. And so I want to talk, I wanted to, to get your feedback on how people can get the sense that there's still that connection in nature. And like, how do they facilitate nature connection? And how can nature connection um, help people navigate the difficulty of what we're facing right now? Yeah, so some of my most profound nature connection moments have been in the city. You know, the, the beautiful thing about being in the city is the high density of animals and birds. So I remember I was going to my sit spot, and we can talk and get into the details of what sit spot is, but I was going to my sit spot in the woods every day, sitting, looking, mapping, engaging in all these practices. And I really didn't see much, mm -hmm. you know, I'm like, come on, John, you've been talking about the red fox. Where's the fox? Like, I want to see it. Like, I, that's like the highest level of nature connection. Like, I'm not, all I see are squirrels and birds. Well, I, I went home to Milwaukee and literally within the 12 hours that I was there, we were driving down the street late at night. And I had my friend pull over because I saw a fox downtown Milwaukee, Wisconsin, in the middle of one of those little triangle grassy pieces. There was a red fox. I had my friend pull over and I got out of the car and I was like 15 feet away from this wild, you know, city red fox. And I was like, I've been going to my sit spot every day for six months and now I'm in the city for 12 hours and I see a fox. And then I hop on YouTube 
and I find all these security camera footage of people in the city recording all kinds of animals, bobcats, foxes, raccoons, um, yeah, all kinds of different weasels and squirrels and all these things. And I'm like, wow, like there is so much life here in the city, but we're often very distracted um, right, a lot of people running around with headphones, and we're looking at our phones, and we don't realize that in our in our little neighborhood, these cities are are really abundant uh, of life that's other than human. So here, you know, I think we we all have you know potentially more time um, in and around our homes, and I'm reminded of these stories that John Young would tell about you know, people in downtown Berlin and going on their balcony and knowing where the Cooper's Hawk is based on how the pigeons are moving around the rooftops in the cities. And that nature is, gives us this thing to engage with. Um, I like this kid one time, you know, I was like, I was, I was, I was like, what's TV? They kept talking about TV. And I'm like, what is TV? And he's like, it's kind of like sit spot, but you get to choose what you want to watch. You know, and, and this idea that there's so much happening outside that we can, we can tune into and tap into and become aware of. And, you know, that knowledge and that awareness is really how we got to where we are right now. That by paying attention to the patterns of the plants and the animals can inform us about our own resources and the birds and nature is also a reflection of our internal state and how we're doing right so i think this the the kind of short answer is nature connection you know is like by going on your back porch and checking in with the world the same way that you would pick up your newspaper to see what's happening with the latest in the corona outbreak, right? Everybody's staying up to date on what's happening, but like how up to date are you on what's happening in the natural world around you right now? Yeah, that's funny. So when I was a kid, I measured the seasons by by the birds. Mm. So I grew up on uh, 12 acres. You know, you've been to my property, but for people who don't know, I grew up on 12 acres at the end of a dirt road that was homesteaded by my family in 1920. Um, and I always knew that spring was beginning when we saw the tanagers and the goldfinches show up, right? And then summer showed up when the swallows came, you know? Um, and then winter was the, was the swans coming. Yeah. And, and then, you know, it's different in the city. Like there's, there's the signals are different or maybe I wasn't tuned into them when I came to the city. Right. But I've, I've slowly learned to, to start tuning into them. And, you know, I remember there was a, um, there's a period, uh, in 2016 when I went through, a major kind of nervous break from over training, over stress, over, you know, work. And, uh, and I couldn't really, I didn't really have access to my movement practice the way that I was used to. I wasn't, didn't have the ability to train the way that I normally did, but I started just walking through the woods every day and I developed this really, um, intense curiosity about what was happening in the woods. You know, it's like, what is that scat? Is that a raccoon scat or a fox scat? Like, why is this hole here in the ground? Um, what lives here? What's, what's eating here? And, and I had the sense that, you know, at the time I was, I was studying Jordan Peterson's work and this idea of meaning a lot, right? And I was thinking about this idea of like, what makes my experience of training in the trees meaningful, right? And, and part of it was this idea that like, I was mapping my territory. Every time that I go in out and move through the trees, the tree became more real to me in a way. Like the more, it was represented in my brain and in my nervous system on a deeper and deeper level. And then I realized that, that movement was just one expression of that. 
And as like nature connection gives you this other way of attuning to this information. And then I had this, this kind of light bulb. It was this kind of this idea that um, there's, there's all this information out there in the natural world. Um, and essentially we're illiterate to it. Yeah. We're, we're blind to these things that were the type of information that we would have been primarily tuned into throughout most of our evolution. Think about how impoverished it would be to me to not be able to read and have access to that information. And then to recognize in some sense that I am illiterate, right? That I cannot read that I can't read the land around me. So I've been, I've been going down into, uh, well, up until a couple of weeks ago when everything went crazy with coronavirus, I was going down to a sit spot in the woods nearby me, um, right near my kid's uh, school, actually, which is right next to Car Creek Park. And, um, and there's, a, I think they're toeys. Um, there's a couple of them out there. But I recognize that I, that I didn't have the sensitivity in my ears I, I think they're engaging companion calls, right? But I can't tell. I haven't yet learned to be sensitive enough in my ears to localize which, like that there's two calls, right? Does it sound like a cat? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, that is a toey, right? Or, yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I was like, what does this cat sound? <laughs> right. Yeah. So this is beautiful. Um, bird with black and orange and little white dots on it right and you said it sounds like a cat yelling um and it's in these uh these patches of um blackberry bushes right and I, and I see one and he's making that his call right and and i'm hearing the call and i can see i think that i can see that the one that i'm looking at is not calling but i can't hear the difference in local uh, locality between he and presumably his mate, right? So I think that I hear one bird calling. <laughs> Logic tells me there's two birds, but my ear doesn't yet have the sensitivity to recognize, to localize where that is. And that's just, it's just, it's the same thing as like not being able to put your foot down precisely on uh, a rock in a creek. It's just, you just haven't done it. You haven't sensitized yourself to that type of information that's what it seems like to me um but but it's it is like we're these extraordinarily clumsy things in the way that we are approaching and understanding this information um when that information would have been the most relevant information for almost our entire evolution and that seems like such a bizarre state to be in for the animal yeah I mean, I have, I've, I've, I'm, I experienced that, you know, growing up, I, I played in the woods, but I didn't have any like intimate knowledge of it. And as I became an adult, I, I knew nothing and, and none of my priorities or my values were, had any kind of nature focus, right? Other than that, I would go disc golfing and I needed to watch out for like poison ivy. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, as I've gone through that process, it, you know, it feels very much like learning a language or, or learning to read. You know, at first you can you, you hear things and you're just curious. Right? You're like, I don't, are they talking about me? Like, what are, they, what are they saying? And then, yeah, as you go through that process, you start to delineate, you know, sounds and behaviors. Um, and then it becomes more engaging because like you're in on the conversation right it's like my my little brother who's fluent in german like he just even just hearing people speak german by him he like gets excited because he's like in a little club right um and and that's the same way as we start to tune and tap into nature we we feel this sense of belonging and i think at the core of what nature connection can do for people is give you the sense of belonging, right? That you, you know, similar to that agape principle, like you just, you belong here because like you are a human and you have the capacity to 
take part in these conversations passively or actively, um, wherever you are, whether, you know, as long as you have access to a window, um, you're able to, to start participating um, in this conversation. So if somebody is listening to this right now and they are, you know, they're unable to leave their house even, or maybe they can just go out into their backyard. Um, they can still begin a wilderness connection program, right? Or a nature connection um, practice, I should say. Yeah, I do. I live here in the northern part of Seattle. And right now, my, in the last three years that I've been here, like I've been actively participating in my backyard. Like I, I keep a part of my backyard untended because I've had three junko nests, dark eyed junko nesting in my backyard every year and raising babies, right? There's a crazy drama that is playing on outside your window right now. It is springtime in most of the northern half of the world and like crows are hunting jays are hunting they're looking for uh this morning my roommate saw a crow across the street gathering nesting materials from somebody's landscaping that they all tore up right so just by in it you know <laughs> it's like this fine line right like by starting to observe the world you are also observing your neighbors <laughs> right and i think that that is a potential barrier for people that i just want to acknowledge and put out there that like if you're looking out the window and you're looking at the birds and the trees and the plants like people might think you're just looking at them right and, and that's just an awkward thing that you might have to to go through um because yeah because you're you're trying to right now everybody's home Right, so like I'm not spying on my neighbor's window. Like I'm looking at the birds in my bed and the robins feeding in my backyard. Um, yeah, so I don't. I just want to acknowledge that little piece of it. But yeah, there's this drama playing out where like birds are having and making nests and babies, and then there are other creatures like rats and squirrels and crows and jays who are trying to kill those babies. Right, and this this complex circle of life and. And once you start to tap in, it's like you have like access to Nat Geo footage, you know, in your backyard every day. But you also have to be okay with the quiet periods, right? There's also lots of time where nothing's happening. And that's where the, like what you said, nature connection is really about your own curiosity, right? It's like, oh, what is that tree? You know, it might be your first question. You might not know what the trees in your backyard or your alleyway or, or what they are and, and starting there and being curious and then letting that pull you along on this journey, things will start to, to pop up and pop out at you. Yeah, it's, it's really, it's been interesting to me. Like since I was a child, I've always been interested in like uh, raptors. When I was in my early teens, I wanted to uh, like do falconry. And so when I'm driving with my wife, right, I'll be like, red tail, red tail, red tail, you know, um, castor oil, blah, bald eagle, whatever. I'm seeing them all the time. They're salient to me. They exist in my landscape. But as I've, you know, as I've dug into some of this stuff, it's like now I see more things. I'm seeing more birds, right, you know, and you know, I, there is a, you know, when you go to the seashore, you see golden eyes and ruddy ducks and, you know, and then what are the songbirds and, you know, the chickadees and the juncos and the, and the towies. Um, and it's fascinating how the things reveal themselves as you slowly begin to pay attention. It's amazing how, how inattentive we are. Right. Um, but if you, if you break that, it's like, you know, for some reason, I've been thinking about the fact that there are peregrine falcons that uh, that hunt basically right over the Aurora and I-5 bridges over um, between North and South Seattle. And 
I pretty much see them, I would say probably 30 or 40% of the time that I drive over to Volunteer Park, our primary training area. So my eyes are always kind of like tuned. A peregrine doesn't actually look that different in size from a pigeon, right? It'd be very easy for someone to see a bird perched on there and think, oh, it's a pigeon. Um, but it's actually a peregrine falcon. This is a, you know, one of the most spectacular uh, predators on earth can fly 200 miles an hour. Um, and they were almost extinct 30 years ago, right? Um, and they're out there. Uh, uh, on the first day of Return to the Source uh, last summer, as I was driving to, um, to Volunteer Park to meet up with the students, I saw this bizarre looking figure that looked like a bird coming through the air, but the wings were super short looking and it looked like it was twice as long as a regular bird, right? And I was like, what is that? And then as I got closer, my eye figured it out. And it was actually a peregrine that was holding a bird that it had killed in its feet. <laughs> and it was flying over to where it was going to perch and eat this bird. Nice. So it's like you see those things. Um, and, you know, one of the things that has been really wonderful about taking my practice into nature has been those moments, right? where I see more stuff like I've seen a family of otters at discovery park twice. You know, um, there was a period where I was going down to, um, to, to do cold immersion every pretty much every night at, um, at car Creek park. And there was a heron who was pretty much fishing next to me as I was in the water every time I was down there. Yeah. Ospreys, bald eagles, sharpies, um, harbor seals go ah, sea lions it's like there's so much that's out there and i'm here living in in north seattle as well um and i think that for me it, it, it does offer this i don't know uh there's something about it that is extremely meaningful and and soothing right just the sense that you're part of this interconnected web that there's these other life forms living their own stories and that you can tune into those stories around you there's something deeply nourishing about that. I don't know. I have another way to describe it, but it's out there. And I think that people, people can get way more of it than they're getting. Yeah. And you know, it's, you know, what you said, like you're, you're being, you're being let in on this other creature's life. Yeah. Right. And I think that the, one of the challenges is nature is has this like delayed gratification right it's like oh man like i go outside like 50 times and i see something cool like twice mm -hmm. right but when you look it's kind of the same thing like the reason you tune into a like a reality tv show right of like these famous people because like you're you're being let in on their life and you're like connecting to them you know in this in this disconnected way but you're you're being let in on the inside picture right and, it, and it's easy and it's accept it's accessible to you but the same thing is happening in nature it just requires a lot more patience but the feeling that you're talking about is like so deep like when you see something cool like that you know it, the feeling is yeah it's it's indescribable like i've had so many moments where i've seen ridiculous things in nature like i woke up one morning and i had uh little juncos like in in my beard and i was like i felt the most accepted by the world that i've ever felt in my entire life right like wow like i am part of nature like you know when i you know, even in my backyard, I get to go and see the little babies, I like lift up the little cardboard grass and I get to see the little babies. And I have that, that empathetic caretaker, like sense of like, Ooh, like I'm going to help them. If I see a crow on the, you know, the fence, I'm going to scare them away. Like, you know, I'm actively participating now in this real live drama. Um, and it's so deeply rewarding. Those little moments of Zen um, are just really profound. 
One thing that brings up for me is this idea that human beings should interact with the natural world or are allowed to interact with the natural world. You know, occasionally on our videos, we get some very irate people who are upset that we are, that we are moving with nature. And the, 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 the sense that you get from them is that they view nature as, as so fragile and human beings as so destructive that any interaction that we have, you know, is going to, to destroy it. And, you know, there's some truth to this, obviously. It's like if you see what happens to a field of grass after a big concert, you know, that thing gets wrecked. Yeah. And, and I, I recognize this is a real, there's a real issue that we could have as natural movement and natural parkour grow, right? Is that, you know, there's two and a half million people in, in Seattle. It's like if, if all of them were training at the trees in Volunteer Park, it could be very destructive. So how do you see this as somebody who's kind of been in the world of, of, of wilderness awareness? How do we balance this, this issue of sustainability? Because the flip side for me is, I feel like if you, if you don't allow people to touch nature, it's gonna be very hard to turn them into people who will care deeply about it enough to, to become stewards of it. Yeah, I think it's one of the biggest topics of, of conversation because like I have friends who work on like restoration sites and they say, you know, if you go hiking, it's something like 50 boot steps, you know, will kill the heather, right? But you want people outside and, you know, you want to get to the, you know, the beautiful connective spot. So, mm -hmm. so how do you balance that? And, and it really comes down to like awareness. Like the deepest level of, of nature connection is just being aware, right? And, and awareness is, is built through education and experience. And those people, you know, like when you have the experience, uh, like when I go and harvest things, like I harvest a lot of bark for baskets or berries to eat or all these things. Like I, I get to learn about my impact and like, I feel, I feel bad when I break a branch. Like it, I, I deeply feel for that being because I am connected to it. And then that in, helps inform my future behaviors. Right. So it's this push and pull that like, yes, like, you know, I would argue that having more people connected to nature you would build the empathy to want to leave it better than you found it right that you would want to have a positive impact um when you go out there versus people who view nature as a museum they're they don't want to touch things so they think that they're not having a negative impact you know, but they're, 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 they're still having an impact when they go out there. And I would lean towards like interaction and communication as ways to build empathy, to have more positive interactions, right? Like, you know, as I get to know this tree more, I know that it can better support my weight. And if I'm an inner, and then I, as I learn about that tree, I actually learn that the more I play on that tree in a respectful way, the more that tree builds greater resilience over time, right? And, and that's with everything. So like, um, so yeah, it's a combination of like experimentation and awareness. Like if, as you frequent spots, you will become more aware of your impact, right? And yeah, it's not, a, there's no easy answer but you can have a regenerative impact um, or you can, have, uh, you can have a passive negative impact um, as well, right? Yeah, I mean, I think people forget that in these environments had humans in them for a very long time, right? Yeah. You know, humans, humans are, are animals, right? It is, it is perfectly natural for a tree to have a primate moving around in it. That's what we are. 
for primates. Um, and and pr I know other primates are going to tear limbs off that that get in their way, right? Like I, well, I just watched a a, um, a documentary, or I just watched BBC's Dynasties video of, of chimpanzees, and they they can be very harsh with their environment as they're moving around. I'm not advocating that. I'm just saying that people people don't s seem to recognize that there's this dynamic interplay between all the things in an environment. The problem with humans, of course, is just that we have so much technological power and such so much there's just so many of us right and so we have to be much more we have to be stewards right if we all act like the big chimpanzees uh in the forest ripping the trees down to show off how strong they are um, then there won't be a nice environment for us to 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 be around you know we'll we'll deprive ourselves of this um but at the same time uh It, it it is in us to be in these places and those places you know can can adapt to a certain amount of stress like people don't recognize that a tree is a living thing and that it is going to be stressed by winds right There's a lot of times i'll be on some huge thick limb right um and i'll be like 15 feet out on that limb and the limbs moved you know this much up and down and someone will be like oh you're going to injure that tree like <laughs> come here in a windstorm and watch how much this branch is displaced up and down and ask yourself if my little body can do anything relative to that um but of course when i'm on a slim limb it's a very different story and people need to be aware of those differences but the only way to make people aware is to is to educate them to get them moving to get them in the trees like people don't have a map for for what that is yeah, it's like, you know, it's just judgment without experience or education. Mm -hmm. You know, like you're hurting that tree. Like, on what basis do you actually think that? Right? Like, who are you as a tree expert, you know, <laughs> to tell me what the experience of the tree is? Mm -hmm. Right? And it's, and it, yeah, I think like I, like I teach uh, foraging classes at Discovery Park as well, and and it's just this encouragement to like it's okay if you mess up, like it's 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 okay if you, you know, like if you maybe you like over harvested or when you were picking the berries you broke that branch, right? It, like it's okay to mess up. Because like I think through those failures, you you hopefully feel that empathy and you want to do better. Right? Like so my foraging spots, like I go to them every year and I want to make them more prolific and more vibrant. And 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 what you said is like that stewardship mentality. Like, you know, we want to protect these places, but you don't protect things you don't care about. And if you don't care about it because you don't have connection to it, right? And that connection is, you know, you need awareness of it to start building. Like, if you don't see the tree, right? Like, you know, like what you said about the hawks. Like, when we first teach people about bird language and birding, all of a sudden people see all the red tailed hawks. And they're like, oh my God, you ever seen a red tailed hawk on the side of the road? Like, I think it's a new thing. Like I've lived here, you know, 20 years and I've never seen a red tailed hawk on the side of the road. Like, did they just migrate here? It's like, no, your brain literally didn't filter it for relevant information. And so you don't see it because you're not aware of it. And then you build it. Yeah, like I, could, I drive from here to Duval. I see easily 30 different types of raptors on the side of the road, right? You know, it's like, because I have an awareness and a connection, um, you know, and I, and I start to be more mindful of my impact. You know, like a great example, one of the most aware connected people that I know around uh, um, predatory birds is a, is a falconer. Yeah. And he was like, Kyle, you wanna go, you wanna go uh, catch a red tail hawk with me? I was like, yeah, and you know where we, I thought we were going to go like deep in the woods and we we're going to go on this like super scouty mission 
and all this stuff. We drove up and down I-5 trying to catch pre uh, raptors. And he knows about, like, he wants to catch them because the birds living on the side of the road have a really high, like, mortality rate. Like, they don't make it is long because of all the pesticides in the fields and then their food. So he actually catches the bird, raises them in the wild and releases them back out there. You know, it's, it's tough, but like hunting and trapping, you know, do build connection. And, and so I just encourage like the more we can interact with our environment and give ourselves permission to mess up, as long as you're learning and, and you have some sort of empathy for your actions, I think that is what really builds stewards of our yeah. places. I think that's a good message. I, I do worry about rapid adoption though, right? Like where there was a, um, like Gasworks Park. Gasworks Park is one of the most famous parkour spots in, uh, in Seattle. And the, there was a tree in the middle of the gasworks. And my buddy Dane discovered this very cool route where you could swing around the tree, right? So you could, you could basically um, jump off of a wall, grab a branch, and grab another branch and swing and swing and swing. And this was before we had kind of discovered a lot of the, the parkour stuff. Um, over the next few years, people who didn't have a background in moving in trees and only were used to urban parkour managed to jump up and break off all of the lower limbs on that tree and you know and a lot of them were tourists who came one time to this famous spot hit up this tree went for this skill and just weren't aware of how to use the environment or how to interact respectfully with the environment and bang you know it's like the the grass in the field so I think it's important that people recognize that, you know, if you break a limb, it's not the end of the world. But at the same time, um, if we have too many people who aren't paying attention or breaking limbs, then, then we're going to injure the, these environments in ways that are unrecoverable. You know, the thing I always emphasize when I'm teaching people is if you break a rail, someone can come back and replace the rail. Mm -hmm. if you take a limb off of a tree, um, it's never, it's never, it's never going coming back. Right? It's never yeah. coming back, and and you're potentially damaging that tree in a way that's going to, um, that's going to impact its health long term, right? Um, especially with some of the smaller trees. You know, if you take a, uh, you know, basic limb off the cedar tree, you're probably not going to hurt the tree very much. A big cedar tree, but if you're like on a rhododendron or a laurel and you break off a branch, um, you might be exposing that tree to to a disease, you know, you're stressing that tree out, you're making that tree much more likely to, um, uh, to not survive over the long term. So I think that one thing that we really need to think about as if this, you know, I don't think it's a big issue yet. That tree that died, that it didn't die, the tree's fine, like it lost its lower limbs and then nobody swung around on it and the, the tree survived. The, the issue just fine. It just, you can't do parkour in that tree anymore at Gasworks. But um, it was a tragedy of, of too many people who had too little sophistication. Yeah. And the, the thing that's great about what we're doing or what's, what's making it okay uh, work, what we're doing now is just that there's not a, a high volume of people who are out there doing it. Yeah. And I think that's where, you know, we have the ability to educate people in that space and it you know like uh katie bowman has this thing where it's like you know you see a sign that says like don't climb a tree yeah you know it's like well if you're not if you don't have like the strength the mobility the coordination and the awareness you know and i think that's the thing that is missing from that that hypothetical sign is you know like you know you need to like have some education. And I think that's what like the nature connection can do. Like just by, you know, step one is just like observation, right? And just like looking at it and, and starting to be curious and, and learning about like trees in general. 
um, can then really inform people to make better decisions. Like I'm not telling people to just like go out and climb trees, right? And, and like all willy nilly kind of thing. It's like really starting with like, you know, observation and learning about that tree and, and, and exploring. And, you know, like I like the Evolve Move Play method it is like exploratory first, right? And then you start to learn the boundaries. And, and yeah, the more we can educate the, the severity of people's actions um, when interacting, you know, just, just as you would with a human when you go into like your martial arts class. Mm -hmm. right like you're not just breaking arms and you're like oops broke your arm like i won't i feel kind of bad like i think we need to have that same level of empathy and respect um for other life forms yeah and i think i went like four years at one point in my practice without having a limb break on me and i remember the first time that i had the limb break after that it was like I, I felt like I, you know, been punched in the gut so hard. Cool thing about it actually was the limb that I broke in that particular situation. Um, it was a, it was a Portuguese laurel and it just healed, right? It cracked. I heard the crack, I dropped off and now I go back and swing on the same limb and it's fine, you know, and I just know how to, to keep my body close enough to the trunk. So, um, we spent a lot of time on this, but what I want people to take away from it is, um, that when we move in nature, we're moving with living things. And that means that we have to think ethically about how we're doing it. Um, and mostly we need to get people back into nature right now. That's the bigger problem. But as we're successful with that, it will also be about recognizing how to spread use so that nothing gets over, over, overused like that poor tree at Gasworks. Yeah. So, um, you've, you know, you were working professionally in wilderness awareness and then you've moved more towards a focus on movement culture now. And so I'm curious how you see the relationship between natural movement, movement culture, um, and nature connection. And, uh, how do those things connect for you and, and what's bringing you more towards the, um, the movement world? Yeah, I think you know, where I really had this pr profound experience in, in nature connection and movement was going to harvest blueberries. And so a lot of the blueberries and huckleberry varieties grow pretty high up in the mountains. And I like to go kind of deeper off trail. Um, and I discovered this why I was, uh, I was putting up Wolverine cameras. I was on a Wolverine monitoring crew and so I had to go like where the wolverines go. And it's pretty treacherous terrain. Um, and as I got out there, it was like the whole forest, or I mean, it wasn't a forest, but the whole ground was covered in blueberries, right? Like my shoes were stained blue. Like it was just everything that you saw for like a hundred square miles were blueberries. And that really, like, I wanted to get back to that place. And my ability to move is, is directly, is in direct relationship with my ability to get to those places. I need to, like, hike, you know, up treacherous mountains. I need to be able to navigate um, uneven, slippery, you know, fragile terrain. I, I, and I need to progressively load my baskets right it's like all of this movement is, is required to actually get the food and to go to the places that I want to go to and and the more that I, I got into movement the more easily I could reach those places and I and I would I would try to bring people to those places and I couldn't like they were, they had a lot of apprehension. They were scared. They didn't feel prepared. The, the danger level for them was really high. And, and it just was like, oh, the, the better I can move, like the more like blueberries I can carry, the deeper into the wilderness I can go, the more chance I might have to see a wolverine or to 
participate in stewarding and monitoring these animals. And so that was my big kind of aha moment where like nature connection and movement are really have a really deep relationship with each other. Cause if I can move really well, but I don't know shit about nature, then like, I don't know the dangers of where I'm moving through. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, Am I going through poison oak or poison ivy? Am I, am I going on fragile terrain? Am I killing all of these plants? Um, you know, what is my impact as a steward as I move through these environments? Like I was on a rock climbing, I was helping rock climbing guys uh, train and they go to all these amazing places, but they have no idea the plant life or the the resources that are around them and they go there and they climb and they have impact that they're not aware of and then they leave right but we can go there and we can be aware of our impact and we can try to climb and and be better about how we're placing gear and moving through the terrain so that we're either having less impact or we can actually have a, a regenerative or a more mindful impact. And so that I was getting the feedback over and over again that, um, yeah, that my facilitation of Nature Connection had a really heavy movement component to it because I, I found that when people move together in nature and play games, there's this really deep aliveness that comes about in those situations. And, and I realized that I want people to have the, the experiences that I'm having. I want people to be able to access the places that I'm going. I want people to come with me, right? Like going to epic, beautiful places is amazing and it's nourishing for me. But when those experiences are shared, it is so much more gratifying and satisfying um, to share those memories with places. And that's what really um, pushed me into being more of a movement coach is, is how can I help people um, be in better relationship with their bodies and that when they care about their bodies, you know, we want to care for the environment. Um, can't think of his name right now. But uh, Frank Ferencik's the kind of long body um, metaphor is that like, you know, how we take care of ourselves is, you know, and how we take care of the earth, like those things can be synonymous, mm -hmm. right? That we want to have beneficial stressors on ourselves as well as the world that we move through. And so I think that was my big moment of like i want more people to be in better relationship with their body so they can better connect to their environment because again if i believe that if people are not connected then they will not be stewards or protectors of these places yeah the it we've used the word awareness a lot and for some reason i'm like Think of this as almost a continuum, right? Where there's like mindfulness, embodiment, movement, nature, right? It's like each of these can be seen as, as levels of awareness and you wanna have integration between them. And, and, and people who, who are raised in a, in a sedentary Western culture, they could go do, move, they could do, go do wilderness awareness stuff. Um, but if they don't have a really deeply developed connection with, with their body, they won't move the way someone who was raised in nature will. And they won't have the same options. And they won't have the same ability to even fully drop into the connection because there's connections in themselves that are that are missed. Um, it seems like it, that seems intuitively true to me, right? And on the same time, it's like, uh, if you train movement, but it doesn't, if you train, you know, if you focus, you know, when I look at people who come from like somatic traditions, sometimes I feel like they've gone so far inside that they've, that they've just inverted and then it's like they don't under there's nothing going there's nothing taking them forward out of it right they've gotten trapped i also see people get trapped in parkour it's like jump 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 okay you you've done the jumps what do they do for you um but if we can start integrating all these layers then um then we can have more awareness and more connection 
And I think that's ultimately what we want. Um, I, I wanted to tell you the story. I don't know if I've told you the story, but I was this summer, I went out to train at um, Green Lake and I was really tired. I just had a wave of fatigue. So I lay down. I was like, I'm just going to lay in the sun for a little bit till I feel better. And then we gonna keep training. And there was some wind in the trees. And I was looking up at these two beautiful trees and you know, they had kind of like a separation in the crowns and they had their, their leaves blowing. So I was looking at blue sky and these, these leaves that have like different colors on the different parts of their leaf blowing in the wind. And I had this realization that like, whatever my theory behind why I wanted to do parkour in nature, or why I thought parkour in nature had maybe more benefits for me from a, like, a, uh, like a motor development standpoint or like, you know, it's more evolutionary relevant or whatever it was like in some sense, I was always destined to put them together because I needed nature in my life and I needed movement in my life. And, <laughs> and I only had so much time. So if I could stack them together, it was the most beneficial thing that I could find. Yeah, I mean, nature requires movement. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, that's why all the animals are super fit <laughs> because they're in it all the time. Yeah. And yet, a lot of people who, I mean, you meet a lot of hunters who are not fit, right? They don't have to chase the game down. They have, they have guns <laughs> or dogs. I'm always surprised. Like, uh, I always thought things is funny. One of the things I pay attention to is, um, uh, for whatever reason, has been hunting with dogs. You know, I, I've loved dogs and been very interested in dogs. And dogs like to have jobs, so I've been interested in where dogs still have jobs. And the most original do job for a dog is to assist in hunting. So there's a lot of like pig hunting with with dogs. Um, and these guys who hunt pigs with dogs, they talk a ton about how, you know, dogs in our culture are fat and they're unhealthy and it's completely the wrong way to treat a dog and a dog needs work the dog needs to be uh run and it needs to be strong and they've got these dogs who are ripped and who can run for miles and miles and miles and they can grab a boar and wrestle with it and come out and then the guy who who owns the dog is just a complete tub of lard right? <laughs> <laughs> like looks like you know just destroyed uh, it's like we we, we need it, it seems like a lack of integration. It's like that. You want that expression on both ends, right? Um, so yeah, I don't know. There's an interesting thing there. I mean, when you look at, like watch some video of hunter forager tribes, you see the way that they move. It's very beautiful. But I see a lot of people who are super deep into nature stuff who are walking around with these boots that are this thick and completely uneducated really in the way that they move and so, you know they've missed they've missed something there this is what as how it seems to me so it's cool i think it's very cool that you're bringing uh movement to the natural to the nature connection world and, and nature connection to the movement world we should, uh we're kind of running towards the end of the time we have here so i wanted to ask you what are what are a few things that someone can do to get started right now in building a deeper connection to nature. Yeah, we didn't really touch on the sit spot. So sit spot is number one. So step one, go outside. Step two, remain, <laughs> right? And and be curious. And like I, I, a lot of, what I do is I go on my back porch and I just observe. And I think that's really the point in which it starts is to go outside and to just start observing and to follow your own curiosity. Like maybe you're curious about plants, maybe you're curious about birds, maybe it's animals or fungi or, or whatever it is, but start there because nature is so interconnected that it will lead you to more and more questions. And the more you can ask those questions out loud, the more you can hold those questions, the more likely you are to get an answer. And, and just kind of like your story earlier, those, those questions that you've held on to a, for a long time, it's almost like the longer you've held a question, the more gratifying the answer is, right? Like, is that Toei? Like, is that a companion call? 
And then like, I bet that day that you see what a Toei companion call looks like is gonna be so deeply rewarding. And it's gonna open up a whole new realm of other questions. And so, yeah, my encouragement is to go outside, to go onto your porch, to look out your window and to just observe and to, and to just ask questions that start popping up in your mind. Like, how come I'm not seeing any animals? Where are all the animals, right? How come, you know, it's springtime. It's really one of the best times. Like, you know, how come this tree flowered and this tree hasn't flowered yet? Like really starting there with a basis and letting your curiosity like pull you along. I think that's like the best metaphor is not necessarily to be like a lot of times in our culture, like we want to be like grabbing knowledge, but I think deep connection comes from what's pulling you outside, right? And for me, it's the berries. Like even when I'm sick, and I'm fatigued and I'm tired. Like if I know there are berries out there, like I literally feel like I have to go outside. Um, so to just tune in and tap into that feeling um, and let your curiosity uh, take you deeper into that journey. Right, cool. And for folks who uh, who'd be interested in researching more deeply, three books that would be the best place to get started in understanding the nature connection world better. Yeah. Uh, what the Robin knows by John Young is I think the best example of how you can get out there and, and start particip participating um, in that journey. Um, the other book that I recommend coyotes guide is good. It's kind of more of like, uh, a teaching model and it's kind of the whole eight shields cultural mentoring model and, and what that looks like and um david abrams becoming animal it's more of like a kind of like an esoteric approach but it, it's it's personal stories about deep connection to nature and culture and what that looks like very cool. Okay. Well, thank you for joining us. Um, I'm sure we'll be talking again soon. Thanks, Kyle. Yeah. Thanks, Ray. Take care and let me know how those toeys are doing. <laughs> thanks for listening to the Evolve Move Play podcast. If you want to support what we're doing, make sure to like, share, subscribe, and hit that notifications button so you know what's coming up. And of course, the biggest support you can give is to become a Patreon supporter. This is what's going to allow us to grow this platform more than anything else. So this is entirely listener supported, and we really appreciate your support. And we look forward to talking to you again soon.